Uh, Jacinda Ardern will meet with US President Joe Biden in less than 24 hours. It's the most important meeting of the Prime Minister's US trip that's being plagued by her delegates being struck down by COVID. Uh, for some analysis on the meeting, former Prime Minister Sir John Key. Morning. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. What has actually achieved at these meetings? Um, practically, in some senses, not a hell of a lot, but you build um, a relationship and rapport and get an opportunity to get to know the person a little bit better. Um, I mean, one of the things that we're really lucky about these days is that New Zealand Prime Ministers go to APEC and East Asian Summit, and uh, in a non-COVID environment, that's when you actually probably get a lot more face time. I mean, that's how I got to know uh, Barack Obama so well and why we end up playing golf. Mm -hmm. But there's no getting away from the fact that a visit to the White House for any Prime Minister, it's a big deal and it's important. Significant. What's the protocol in terms of the topics that can be raised? Does this have to be discussed previously or can you just raise what you want there? Yeah? I mean, in theory, everything's choreographed to an inch of its life. Um, so yeah, there's an agenda and you don't have a lot of time. You feel like you do, but in reality, by the time you get in there and get through the pleasantries and go through uh, the agenda, and you'll have a few things that you want to tell the New Zealand media, you know, I hit these particular points of interest. So yeah, I mean, you can stray. I mean, it's not like you know it's you know there's a rapport there and you know Joe Biden I met him a couple of times when he was vice president once once or twice actually in Washington and then he obviously came to New Zealand so he's a he's a very you know, hail fellow type of thing he's a mm. nice guy he'll, he'll you know it's not like he won't be able to talk about particular issues but I'm sure want to hit those particular points around trade in the Pacific and things yeah and no doubt uh, gun control will come up because it's so, um, yeah. on very much focused on the news agenda there yeah. at the moment. Uh, when she, the Prime Minister was in Washington DC, she was kind of traipsed around the Senator's offices yeah. and used very much as a photo opportunity yeah. for them. Is it wise for the Prime Minister to engage in this kind of discussion with the President? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she can do, obviously, and, I mean, most New Zealanders, I think, would sit there and go, what a ridiculous set of laws and, and rules they've got in America where an 18-year-old can wander along and buy an assault rifle. I mean, yeah, yeah, I understand the Constitution and the right to bear arms. I think there was the right to bear a gun in case a grizzly bear came into your log cabin, not the right to take an AK-47 somewhere or an assault rifle. The problem you've got is it's just not going to change in the United States. So if I was Joe Biden, you know, there's only so much you know, she can talk to him and she can say things and 66%, you know, two-thirds of the US public are actually on the for the side of gun control mm. or greater, greater rules around guns. But nearly half of them have a gun. Um, guns are everywhere <clears throat> and it's just not going to change. The US Supreme Court will strike down, uh, I think, any overarching moves any US president made um, to try and, you know, control guns in America. Um, if we can move on to a yeah, different topic sure. now too, <laughs> because we will have yeah, yeah, obviously yeah. a lot of analysis on this, this tomorrow. The Chinese yeah. Foreign Minister has yeah. been touring the um, Pacific and Fiji lately uh, at the moment. Where do the relations between China and Pacific cross the line? Because it's not like any yeah. relationship is a bad relationship, no. right? But there's a line. Where Where is the line? Yeah, I mean, I think it's where the line is all about sort of total influence and control, I suppose. Um, so, the, you know, the funny thing is, um, I saw the Prime Minister basically saying that, you know, it's not new that China's been in the Pacific. She's actually right. They've been there a very long time. Mm. In fact, funnily enough, the bigger sort of thing was competition between Taiwan and, and, and China and the Pacific to a certain degree. When I was P they'd wandered around there and built lots of different buildings and most of them weren't, you know, terribly good or, you know, mm. up to sort of, you know, a youth standard that would be, you know, beneficial for the Pacific. So we actually tried to convince the Chinese to partner up with us, actually. And we built, for instance, a water reticulation plant in the Cook Islands and things like that. So I think going off to China and saying, hey, don't be in the Pacific, that's a waste of time. So you think work with them? Yeah, I think that's one thing. I think the other thing you've got to make really clear, though, to the Pacific leaders... They, China's been giving soft loans in the Pacific for a long period of time. And I used to say to the Pacific leaders, look, I can't tell you how to run your kind of country's balance sheet, if you like, mm -hmm. but I can tell you this much. If you borrow money, 
they'll want to be repaid and we're not repaying for you. Because I don't think the New Zealand taxpayers should be sitting there saying if, you know, Samoa or Tonga or anybody else wants to go and borrow money and do whatever they want with it, we're on the hook for that. Mm. So, but yeah, look, you know, China's going to be there. They're going to be there forever. The Americans have been worried for a very long period of time. What, what she won't get, I don't think, is the Americans saying, I'm going to do so much more in the Pacific. The, the Americans will say quite simply, we have the whole world to worry about. By the way, you're sitting out there, you're in Australia, it's your backyard, deal with it. Yeah, right, OK, so perhaps don't, don't, don't try and go down that line. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. But, you know. <laughs> just to um, bring you back into yeah, sure. politics yeah, as well. Yeah. Oh, really, you want to do that? OK, <laughs> yeah. yeah unfortunately, unfortunately, you have to with the Brona and she's opposed, so, you know, we had a good, nice little run, but, you know. Um, but remember campaign periods yep. and, you know, attack I ads. do, I do you remember, remember them well. Yep, I remember um, have a look at this. OK. This is um, an ad that's been put out amongst a flurry of ads that have been put yeah. out by the Labour Party. The cost of living crisis, that's how we'll win this election. That one's authorised by Grant Robertson, a picture right. there, of course, of Christopher Luxon. Well, that's great because... What do you make of that? Yeah, no, that's really cool. I think we should be in favour of that in the National Party because it's a nice picture of Chris. And actually, <laughs> um, Chris is really right. The cost of living is the biggest issue that Kiwis face and the government's completely failed on that front, so... Good on them. But, I mean, Grant Robertson says it's not a game. It's not about trying to win a competition. Well, I mean, firstly, how amazing is this that you've got the government, I have no doubt probably using taxpayers' resources funneled through the leader's office somehow where you can't find it, um, that uh, paying for these kind of ads. So, secondly, it's a sign of worry. You know, like, I mean, if you spend time talking about your opposite number, you're worried about them, right? And thirdly... Um, you know, if anyone can theoretically control these things, it would be the government. And one of the reasons that cost of living is under so much pressure is because the government's borrowed the better part of $100 billion. You've now got the Reserve Bank Governor firing up interest rates. The biggest single item that most New Zealanders face is their rent or their mortgage, and that's going through the roof because the Reserve Bank Governor has got no option but to try and counter the spending of the government. So... If they want to make highlight that issue, I'd say <laughs> highlight. I haven't spoken to Chris about it, but I'd say highlight it. You know? Well, also, on highlighting the cost of living, yeah. is there any political party that hasn't made use of a social issue to try and win an election? No, I mean, look, the, you think about it, every single election campaign is a, is a campaign about ideas and about how you want to shape the country, and they ultimately always revolve around social issues. I mean, the big issues that matter in any election, the economy, law and order, health, education, all of those issues are at the forefront of what voters want to hear about. And, um, but I, I just think it's amazing that you've got, you know, essentially the opposition setting the agenda. And when the opposition is setting the agenda and the government's missing in action, um, that might be bad news for the government. Former Prime Minister Sir John Key, thanks yeah. very much for joining us this morning.